Southview fam, welcome today. Pastor Josh has a great message on missions. Hope you enjoy it. Today, I have the opportunity, I am so honored to stand before you and to talk about missions and, and to kind of talk about a mission trip that I went on a couple weeks ago, got back about two and a half weeks ago, spent two weeks in Nepal working alongside of Hope Force International. Some of you know that Hope Force is an organization that Southview partners with monthly, and they, they do a lot of disaster response, but they invited me to come along and, and see another side of what they do uh, across the globe. They, they, had, they do work in Haiti. They also do work in Nepal. And so I got to spend two weeks with them learning and growing and, and, not preaching and not doing anything like like this. So it was such an amazing time. And, and so I have uh, the opportunity to talk to you today, not only about that, but also about something that is that is really uh, part of Southview. Uh, matter of fact, it's in, in uh, our mandate for the year, which is deep. And it's, it, it's actually the two E's, it's engagement and evangelism. That's part of what we are. So please don't, don't think and, and don't take this that I'm just going to sit here and we're going to run through a slideshow and I'm going to show you all the pictures and talk. No, no, no. We're going to talk to, we're going to talk about missions from a really, from a church, a big C church perspective. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, this particular organization and, and where I went uh, and, and the, what they're battling. You know, when I was there, I actually had the opportunity to, to learn and interact with some people and, Learn about this plague, this darkness that is that that's probably one of the darkest things that I've ever come in contact with that I've ever been around. Uh, and, and so, with that, I, I do want to tell you that we're gonna we're gonna address some difficult things today. We're gonna talk about missions. We're gonna talk about uh, the, those people that are actually on the front lines and their importance and why how how it's so important that they actually step into these places and take these missions, take these these things head on. You know, like human trafficking and and specifically child trafficking. We're gonna talk about that today. Some of you may be like, man, I didn't come here for this, but well, let me tell you something. This is an opportunity for us to, to address an issue that is a global issue, that is something that is, that is plaguing the world today. Because this is reality, y'all. This is reality. It happens. The church can't continue to, to turn a blind eye to it or to not look at it because it's ugly and because it's dirty and because we, it, doesn't, it doesn't shine from a pulpit. That's not what we're talking about today. We have to take action. We have to step into this. We have to, to, to go after the things that hurt God's heart. We have to do it. And I'm preaching already and I haven't even gotten started. You know, oftentimes from this pulpit, you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear the leaders talk about and, and encourage our young adults and, and, and talk about them and, you know, talk about this, the truth that they're looking for. And we'll oftentimes, you know, encourage them and, and exhort them and go, 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 this is great. And, and then on the flip side of that, you'll, you'll hear us talk about the, our sage group, our seniors, the, you know, the over 55, the over 60 that are, that are really having this incredible, they, they have this great community and they're coming together. But I kid you not, we will oftentimes be asked, well, I don't fall into that young adults. I'm not 18 to 29 and I'm not a senior. I, I, I'm not over 55. So I really, what about us in the middle? Guess what? This message is for you. Why? It's actually for everybody. But why is it specifically for us in the middle? And I say us because I'm there too. Why? Because this message will speak, will highlight the truth that the young adults are looking for. This message will highlight the support area that, that our older generations are looking for, they're looking to pour into. And for us in the middle, it's going to provide three things, a reason, a need, and a cause. And if you can't grab onto any one of those things, then you need to go back and listen to this message again later this week. But, you know, when we talk about that, what, what, what oftentimes comes up is, you know, we say, oh, well, you know, he, when, I, when I mentioned that we talk about young adults, oh, well, you're just shining a light on them or you're shining a light on Sage. How about this? And this is going to kind of ring truth to this whole message. How about this? What if we stop caring about who the light is being shined on and just take the opportunity to say, hey, they, the young adults, they have the energy and the time and, and I don't. So what I can do is I can pour into them and allow them to rise up. What if we took our, our strengths and their weaknesses and their strengths and our weaknesses, and we combined them and allowed it to pave the road for everything that God is doing. What if we did that and quit caring about who gets the light shine on them? It's not about that. At the end of the day, what we want is change. And change starts today, and change starts with each and every one of us. 
I'm not going to sit here and tell you to buckle up because this is going to be a big message because I want you to be jostled around. I want you to be tossed and turned. I want you to, to have to wrestle with this because this is a big deal. This is a really big deal. But before we get there, we have to talk about missions. And really, I'm going to talk about two types of missions, short-term missions and long-term missions. And within the church, there's a need for both of those. And we're going, to, we're going to explain that a little bit. But there's typically two types of people in the church when it comes to missions. There's the sowers that are able to, to sow in. Maybe they can't go, but they're going to, they're going to sow in a little bit or, or however they can. And then there's the goers. And those are the ones that will actually take to the mission field, that will actually run short-term missions, long-term missions. Those are the ones that will actually do that and have the ability to do that. And that's why I've titled this mes message on missions, So Go. If I were to sum this message up, if I were to sum everything up, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. If I were to sum this whole thing up in one sentence, it'd be this. It doesn't matter what you do, just do something. It doesn't matter what you do, just do something. You can sow or you can go, but you can't sit idle. Period. I know that's more than one sentence, but you get what I'm saying. Just do it. See, told you to come back. There's actually a discussion in the churches, Big C Church, or, or an argument, if you will, about short and long-term missions and, and the, the pluses and the minuses of them. And, and oftentimes when we talk about short-term missions, the, the folks that, that don't necessarily agree with them all the time say that, that short-term missions do nothing but create a, an unhealthy dependency on repeated short-term intervention. Meaning, places that we go, create a dependency for us just to keep coming back and pouring into them. It doesn't give them the, the ability to, to, to figure it out on their own or, or grow themselves. And that's, that's a, a broad stroke. I get it. But that's one of the arguments in the church, believe it or not. And what it does to the local church body and what people think it does is it gives us this, this white knight, like, Hey, I, I'm coming in to save the day. I'm coming in. I'm bringing resources. I'm bringing time. I'm bringing talent. I'm bringing money, whatever you need. And I'm saving the day. And it takes the focus off of Christ. Because at the end of the day, we're not saving anybody, right? On the other side of that coin is long-term mission. Now, some people argue against long-term missions, basically saying that it takes missionaries out of, the, out of their local church body. They kind of go native, if you will. They become one of the people that, 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 they're, that they're, they're working with, and it disconnects them from, from their local church body and, and the outside, outside of their service area. Now, here's my question that I would ask you. If, if it's in this book and, and Jesus demonstrated it, isn't it safe to say that if he demonstrated it, maybe we should probably demonstrate that too? And so today what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to point out three instances where Jesus actually demonstrated both short and long-term missions. Point number one is this, that Jesus sent out a small team on a short-term mission. Turn with me, if you will, and if you don't have your Bibles, just look at the screen. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6 says this, And he called out the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God to, and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff nor bag, nor bread nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there. And from there depart. And wherever you do not, they do not receive you. When you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now, the scripture really doesn't say how long they were gone. But we know that, that the very next thing when they come back, the very next thing that Jesus does is, uh, is feed the 5,000. So they probably weren't gone too terribly long. A couple days, maybe a week, two weeks. I mean, even if it was a month, it's still out and back, right? But what Jesus was doing in this instance when he was sending them out is he was preparing for what was getting to come, for what was coming. What Jesus did is he empowered his disciples. He encouraged his disciples and he supported them. He said, go, go out and come back. But it wasn't, he didn't just stop at the small groups. I love to say, I love to take a small team. I really do. You know, that's seven to 10. That's a perfect size team for me because once you get larger than that, sometimes it, you, you, as a leader, you start to just get in the management piece and you can't really dive into the mission. Does that mean that we wouldn't take a large team? Absolutely not. It's just a lot easier. It's a lot, a lot more comfortable to send that seven to 10. Jesus sent 12. But as I said, he laid the groundwork for what was to come, which is point number two. Jesus sent long, sent large groups 
on short-term missions. If you flip over to Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, it says this. After this, the Lord, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest and send out laborers into, this har into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the, in the midst of wolves. You see, he sent a large group, but he broke them off into small teams. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes when you go on missions, uh, especially with large groups, you split up. When we were in Nepal, we actually, we all, we all gathered in Kathmandu. We all landed and rallied up in Kathmandu. And then we actually had a medical team that went out that kind of forward deployed in front of us. And the construction stayed, construction team stayed in Kathmandu and we worked for a little while. And then we all came back together. Uh, it, but, but here's the thing. So we were together like the 72 we were sent out and then we came back together. We were the same team with the same mission of service in different places doing different things. Doesn't change what we were doing. Doesn't change the mission that we were on just because we were in two separate places. It actually broadens our net. It actually, it actually widens us out a little bit, allows us to affect more people. That's what Jesus did with the 72. He sent them out to go in any direction. Point number three, this is where we talk long-term long -term missions because Jesus sent everyone. Jesus sent everyone, everyone in this congregation, everybody. Jesus sent us. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. Jesus modeled small teams with the 12. He modeled large teams with the 72. And he models uh, both with short-term missions and then he models long-term missions, lifelong missions with all of us. Go, all of us, not Pastor Josh, not one or two of you, all of you have the same commission. Go make disciples of all nations. That means globally and locally. Let me just dispel a quick rumor real quick right now. You don't have to go to Nepal. You don't have to go to Mexico. You don't have to go to Canada. You don't have to go anywhere besides out that door and in the parking lot and drive home and go to work because guess what? You're in a nation. All nations includes ours. It includes our nation to be able to affect change, to be able to do something in your areas of expertise, of your areas of influence. All of us go on mission. All of us are called on mission. All of us have the same commission. So don't think that you have to take a, a mission trip across the, across the pond in order to affect change. You can do that right here. But how do you do that? Very simply, through relationship. Jesus' relationship with his disciples was so much and so close that when he sent the 12 out, he trusted them to go and, sh and, and share the gospel, his gospel, the good news. He gave them the authority, his authority. He gave them his authority, and he gave them his blessing. He said, go. But you know, the problem is, is in church so often what we want to do is we want to keep everybody we want to keep them here rather than send them out because why? If you are so good at what you do, why do I want to send you out? I can't lose you. That's what we do. But if we're not sending, if we're not sending everybody, if we're not sending people, then we're not obeying. It's that simple. If the church comes in and says, I want to keep every, every, every person serving because they're so good, and if they left, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. We wouldn't be able to have this service. If that's the case, y'all, let me tell you, that's wrong. You need to be in a, in a position to where you can send people when God calls them. Bucking against that system doesn't work. When, when God calls somebody to step out and they come to you and say, hey, God's calling me to step out, you should say, what can I do to help you? We shouldn't try and keep them. Well, that's great, Pastor Josh, but what about the people here? What about in our local area? Well, I just told you, you're on the mission field. I agree. 
We, you, you should sow into your city, you know, sow into your area, sow into your work. What are you doing? Well, I serve. That's great. Rally people up to serve with you. It doesn't have to be a pastor that, that says, hey, I need to get a whole team together. You have that authority. Jesus commissioned you. You have the authority to rally people. Regardless of if we're serving locally or abroad, we can't serve without relationship. Because if we do, we're setting ourselves and we're setting people up for failure. You know, areas throughout the globe don't, aren't always super welcoming when an outsider comes in and, and tries, to, tries to do things without a relationship built. They have to have that relationship. Don't believe me? Raise your hand if you're from Tennessee and raise your hand from California and then ask the Californians how they felt when they moved to Tennessee. We're not super welcoming. Let's go. It happens. I'm not, I'm not look, look, no shade on anybody that I'm just saying, if we're doing that here, imagine what that's like in a culture that's not our own. Without proper relationship, we're not able to effectively do missions. We're not able to effectively cause change. If we do send people, we have to, we have to take the time to be there for somebody. As leaders, whether it's in, in missions or it's in business, if, if we find somebody that says, hey, back to what I stated at the beginning, hey, you are really good at this. As a leader, I should say, what can I do to propel those qualities? What can I do to lift you up? What can I do to come alongside you and make you better than I am? Because the second that we start to hold people down, the second that we start to say, hey, you're, you're kind of threatening to me, what are we doing? We're stopping the mission. When we propel people, we, prov- we, we uh, help the mission and we help the mission and those people thrive. But we have to be there and we have to follow up. Jesus was always there for his disciples. You have those three points that I wrote down. Let me just, let me just tell you, and you, you don't have to write these down. You can read them yourself. But in Luke uh, chapter nine, verse 10, the 12 returned and told Jesus of everything that they had done. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17, the 72 returned full of joy, telling him about what they had done. And then in Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says he's always going to be there. Look, we have to realize that missions, whether it's here or anywhere, it's not about us. It's not about us. And it's not about us doing it alone. That's why we need sowers. That's why we need goers. We need short-term missions. We need people that are willing to go out on a week or two and be able to say, what can I do for you to come low? What can I do for you? How can I help you? Let me build, what can I pour into you? What can I take off your plate? How can I exhort you to, to, to encourage you to keep going? One of the most, most heard comments from talking to missionaries that, I, that I've heard is, we're tired. We're so tired. We pour out, we pour out, we pour out, and we just don't get filled. They say, don't get me wrong, the money helps, that helps us with our mission, but the encouragement helps with our commission. It helps us continue to go. And on the flip side of that, we need the long-term missionaries because they're the ones that are, that are learning the culture. They're the ones that are there. They're the ones that are, that are understanding and building those relationships who have laid down their, their dreams and desires and their goals for the calling of God. It's a reciprocal relationship. Short-term needs long-term, long-term needs short-term. I've worked and talked with, with missionaries who've done both. And I know there's a need for both. And the sooner that we understand that there's a need for both and stop arguing about little things of, of, well, this does, this works and this doesn't stop. We need to just understand there's a need for both. Pastor Charles Curtis, who some of you may know, he's spoken here a couple times. He actually, he lived in Malaysia and now he comes back and he does shorter mission trips. Pastor Stephen Tolman works in, in the cartel controlled areas of Mexico, but he's, he's Canadian living in San Pedro, Mexico. And you'd never know the difference. You'd never think that he was from anywhere outside of, outside of Mexico because that's what he's done. He's, he's cultivated this, this relationship. He's, he understands what's going on. He understands the people. He understands the culture. And most recently, the missionaries that I talked to are Silvio and Rose Silva who work with kids coming out of child trafficking in Nepal. And that's where I want to spend probably the next 30 minutes talking to you about what they do and what they see. 
As I said, we, I, I, I had the, the honor and the privilege to spend uh, about two weeks in Kathmandu and in the foothills of the Himalayas. And you'll see behind me, as we put up this uh, uh, the slide, there's a, there's a heavy Hindu, uh, Hindu culture, but there's also a Buddhist culture. On, the, uh, on this big white temple here, that's a Buddhist, it's up on the, up on the hill, it's a Buddhist, uh, a Buddhist worship temple. And just under that's actually a monastery that, that we walked up to and, and just walked around because it was really cool. On the, on the other side, as we were going up to the farm, that's a, a giant statue of, of one of the Hindu goddesses, Goddess Shiva, I believe is who it is. And then the one in the middle is actually about a half a mile from where we were staying. And there's a little sign that says, if you're not Hindu, you can't enter in here. But it was so cool to see. But you know where Christianity is in this? About this big, little tiny spot. Little tiny spot because that's the culture. But the folks that are there don't, don't press against that culture. They understand. They plant. They sow. They make a difference. Our medical team went, went a little further uh, when, we, when we went up to the farm. Medical team went to a village about eight or ten hours away, and the construction team stayed in Kathmandu for a couple extra days. And when we were there, we were... Uh, we all met up at the farm, which was, uh, it's about eight hours away. I think it took us about eight hours. You think, oh, wow, eight hours, 70 miles an hour. It's like 400 miles. No, it was like 70 miles. But because of the roads, it took us a long time to get there. But it was the most beautiful countryside. It was fantastic. But as we were in Kathmandu, and, and when we went up to the farm, we were working on, on, uh, on, on some classrooms. Uh, and, oh, yeah, here's some pictures. We were working on some classrooms, one on the roof, one, one off to the side of the school. And then we were working on this, this house. This red building is actually uh, where they're going to keep their pigs. And we were, we were working to, to get water down there. And so that way, it's, it's, a, it's pretty much a, a self-sustainable watering system. As they're building, as, as Silvio and his team are building up at the farm, what they're doing is they're looking, they're building some quarters for, for people that are working to come in and be able to stay there when they're up there. But also they're looking at the future, which is to build some, some, uh, some maternity type areas. And the reason is you may, you may be like, oh, that's kind of cool. But no, you have to understand that, that in the area, when a woman gives birth, she's not allowed back in the house until she stops bleeding. So oftentimes what they'll do is they'll put them in the barn with the baby. They'll put them where, wherever they can, but they're not allowed in the house. So what these places will do is they'll, they'll provide an opportunity for women who, are, who, are, who just had birth to be able to come and, and stay until things get healthy. That's what they get to, to deal with. That's what they get to, to do. That's their get to. I mentioned that we had a medical team that, that went out a couple days before us, and they went to some of the, some of the uh, different villages, and they actually saw over two weeks, they saw six hundred patients. Now, I'm not, these, aren't, these aren't, you know, severely uh, um, uh, hurt people. A lot of it's just random routine checkup, but they saw 600 people. They, they have a, had a dentist that traveled along with them that this dentist did, he saw over 200 patients and did over 200 fillings and extractions. That's incredible. 200 in two weeks? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, we didn't just go and find these people. We didn't just show up. There wasn't a team of us, team of 12 of us, of us that, that showed up and just said, hey, we're here to work. No, it was through a cultivated relationship, through a deep relationship. Well, with who, Pastor Josh? With Hope Mobilization. They were born out of the yes of Silvio Silva and his family. Now, here's a guy that if you ever get to meet him, and I pray that you do, you can't help but love him. Just because he's, he's just full of joy. He carries the joy of the Lord. You can't be in a bad mood when you're around this guy. He's actually Brazilian, moved to Nepal. So he speaks Portuguese, Nepali, and English. And when he gets all three of them going, I swear half the time he's talking in tongues. I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> because I'll be like, I'm tracking, I'm tracking. I have no idea what you just asked me. But he has such a heart. And he, has so, he just wants to, to give and he wants the best for people. But he and his wife moved to, to Nepal to, to rescue, start to rescue girls who were, who were uh, being trafficked for sexual exploitation. They created a, a program called Apple of God's Eyes, and it's developed to, it was developed to assist those coming out of trafficking. 
To date, they have had more than 600 girls come through their various homes, living with them at various stages of life. More than 50, yeah, absolutely. More than 50 of the girls that they've had come through their homes have been repatriated to their countries. They've assisted with more than 3,000 scholarships for various, for various, whether it be to a, to a school, to university, 3,000 scholarships. They've created vocational programs that teach things like sewing and tailoring, where these, where these girls and these women can come in and they can make tablecloths and backpacks and school uniforms. And I actually, they made me a school uniform and I was so excited. I was planning on wearing it today and I, like a chucklehead, I took it home and I washed it and I shrunk it because I'm not good at it. So it would have been like fat guy in a little coat if I was up here. But let me tell you, it was incredible. I'm looking at all these kids and they all are wearing these uniforms and they're made right there. Why? Because that's part of, that's a, that's a trade that they're learning. They're starting to offer baking classes so people in the, in the community can order cupcakes and cakes and things like that. They have a beauty parlor that they've established that takes women and allows them and teaches them how to cut and style hair to do makeup. And that beauty parlor is actually a part of a, of a, 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 a shop called their Beautiful Bride Shop, which is a one-stop shop for, for wedding planning. That means that women who are getting married can come in and rather than spending thousands on wedding dresses, they can actually rent a wedding dress. They can rent all of the, all the accessories and all that stuff. They can be made to feel like a princess and on their special day. And it's all because these girls have an opportunity. But who are these girls? That's always the question. Well, let me share two stories. I asked Silvio to send me a handful of, uh, of stories and, and I pulled two of them to share with you. Now, I do want to say that the names that I use in these stories are not their actual names. We've changed their names for, for, for two reasons. One, to protect their identity, but more so to protect their dignity. Because here's what I'll tell you. As we got to know some of these girls, we don't know their stories. And to be honest with you, I don't want to know their stories. I don't. They had something happen to them. That's what I need to know. They're in a bad way. They, they, they were in a bad way. That's all that I need. I don't need to know the details. So to protect their dignity, we've changed their names. <clears throat> There's an area in Kathmandu where a famous Hindu temple is located and open area cremations happen regularly. Thousands of Hindu pilgrims flock to the area to worship and pray. The area is also well known for prostitution. Girls are sold and taken on pilgrim buses to India where they're sold to brothels. Mary and Penny were two of these girls. They were young prostitutes and thieves, often sleeping on the grass near the temple. After many conversations, they, were, they finally arrived at the Net Police home, ready for a change. Mary was bald and most, which from, most likely from malnourishment. As many of the days they were on the street, they would barely have enough money for a cup of tea. Penny had, also been tra had already been trafficked to Mumbai, India, where thousands of Nepali girls just like her taken to the brothels. Unfortunately, after a few months uh, at the home, Penny returned to prostitution, but Mary stayed. Now, at 13 years old, and having never gone to school, it was a difficult process to get her enrolled in school, but they finally admitted her into the fourth grade, and she began her studies. Now, let me pause for a second. 13 years old, fourth grade, how's that happen? Because the great thing about this organization is when the girls come in, whatever level they're at, that's where they put them. Whether they're, whether they're 13 years old and they have a fourth grade level or whether they're 16 years old and a seventh grade level, it doesn't matter. So it's okay. it was nothing to see a 13-year-old studying with seven and eight-year-olds. Oftentimes, the, the older ones will progress a little faster because they'll pick things up a little quicker and they'll be able to burn through the grades a little faster. But that's regular. Mary was smart and quick thinking, but she struggled with her schoolwork. Those struggles led to anxiety toward the end of the school year because if a student doesn't pass their final exams, they're beaten by their teachers and their parents. That feeling of, I'm not capable, that, that anxiety led to feelings of, I'm not capable and I'll never be anything. But in that moment, an opportunity for ministry arose. From her feelings of anxiety and inadequacy, the team began to tell her that through Jesus, all things that she, was, that, that she could do, all things were possible and that she wasn't expected to pass her exams, rather that she just did her best. And if she didn't pass, she wouldn't be punished. The day came when the exam results arrived and, and Silvio said to her, Mary, I asked you to do your best, didn't I? 
Mary took the envelope and was shaking hands, opened it, sure she had failed. But the results showed something different. The once bald thief, child prostitute, defied the odds stacked against her and passed her exams. And since that time, her hair has grown long. She's changed her name. And she's finding her way and living a life she'd only once dreamed about. Praise God. Praise God. Man, I struggle with this story. Becky lost her father, who was a school principal at her village at a very young age. Sometime after she lost him, she was trafficked from her village into central Nepal to a brothel, trafficked from her village in central Nepal to a brothel in Kolkata, India. She was so small that when she arrived at the brothel, the owners gave her growth hormones to speed her growth and development. Despite her situation, she carried deep in her heart a dream to restore her father's school. Becky was eventually repatriated to Nepal and arrived at the Nepalese home with her dreams. She was motivated and active and worked hard towards her goals. Even at a young age, she showed the heart of Christ as she often spoke to people about her experiences and told them not to judge the people of her village who sold her. She explained they had no knowledge of how trafficking could so badly affect the children being trafficked. As she grew into adulthood, she continued to follow her dreams and now has a large school and interacts with the community, teaching them about the dangers of human trafficking. These are the people. These are two stories. 600 people have passed. More than 600 people have passed through their doors. And these are two stories. You got a little girl that's talking about the love of Christ, showing the heart of Christ. Don't judge the people who sent me to this bad place because they didn't know any better. Sound familiar? Let me change it for you. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How does that happen? Who are these girls? Who are they? They're the 12,000 Nepali girls that get trafficked from Nepal to India and other areas each year for sexual exploitation. They're the ones that have had their innocence stolen from them. They're the ones that have seen the ugliest side of humanity but they're the ones that cry out in joyful praise because God had a rescue plan for them. They're the ones that are safe now, but there's so many others that aren't. The International Labor Organization estimates that 3.8 million adults and 1 million children under the age of 18 are currently under forced sexual exploitation. 99% of those are girls. 73% of them are from Asia, and 74% of those live outside their country of birth. The United Nations estimates that human trafficking generates $32 billion a year. $32 billion. 85% of that is from sexual exploitation. That's $27 billion annually. $27 billion annually. This is something that affects, that, that happens across the globe. Across the globe. It's, just, it's not just Nepal. It's not just India. It happens right here. Right here in the good old US of A. Right here in Tennessee. Don't believe me? He stepped outside, but ask Scott Owens about his, his, his interaction with people on Highway 24 and Highway 40. All the time. It happens right under our noses. How? How? Well, in Nepal, economic factors, ignorance factors. You see, when you have limited resources, that's an opportunity for traffickers to come in. Promises of money, promises of education, promises of jobs, that opens the door. That opens the door to, to what, to, for them to come in and deceive these poor villagers. What parent isn't going to stand there and say, wait a second, I have nothing. You mean that, that I can, my kid can have a job? You mean that, that she can go and, and go to school or he can go to school? Absolutely. Yeah. And the trafficker says, yes, I'll, I'll walk them into their calling, which is my calling. There's also cultural factors. Nepal is, is, is extremely patriarchal. It's just how it is. One of the responses that, that Silvio told me that they hear across Nepal and India when it comes to, to girls is, is we don't care if kids are born girls, as long as they're born to the house next door. 
I actually had a conversation. I said, as a dad, I, I don't understand this. How can, how, can, how can a father, how can a father do this? How can a mother do this? And the response that is so often heard, what's it matter? It's just a girl. What's it matter? It's just a girl. It's just 50% of God's creation. What's it matter? After the manipulation or the sale of, of these young girls, they arrive at a brothel and they're already in debt. They're already in debt. Travel expenses for a trip they didn't want to take. Food that they desperately needed. All their clothes, it's all charged to them, all charged to their account. They can leave at any time. All they got to do is pay their debt. The problem is all the money that they, that they earn goes to the owner of the brothel. They're never going to get out. They're never able to pay. Much like the, 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 the organization that we work with, Operation Freedom of Slavery, that, that, we, that, that frees people from these brick kilns, it's the same thing. You're so in debt, you're never going to pay. Now they can try and escape, but there's so many threats. There's so much surveillance. There's corruption. All of those things make escape impossible. These girls are stuck. They're stuck. They're treated terribly. They don't go and have their own little room at a minimum. No, no, no. They're treated horribly. They're malnourished. They're physically and psychologically tortured daily. Many of them have contracted diseases. A lot of them contract HIV before they're even 18. They're forced to see between three and 40 customers per day with the average being 14. 14. If that doesn't shock your soul, I don't know what will. This is a generational problem too. When a woman has a child that's, in, that's, that's being sex trafficked, when they have a child, oftentimes that child will follow in their footsteps because that's the area, that's what they're grown in, that's, what they, that's all that they know. They'll start begging at a young age and then when they hit their preteens, that's when they'll enter prostitution. One story that we heard while we were there was of a, of a, of a teenage girl that showed up at one of the homes with her three-year-old son. Teenage girl, three-year-old son. And her son used to hide under the bed while her mom worked. These are the stories. These are the statistics. I'm not making this up. I'm not telling you all of this to, to, have, to, to, to throw this crazy message on you and, and shock your system. I'm telling you about the ugly side of the world that we don't get to see. The ugly side of, of outside the church walls. The ugly side of humanity that we don't want to talk about. That's why I tell you this. That's why I'm talking about this. I want to tell you a story of an experience that I had while I was there. As I mentioned, they had a number of, of different houses that we, that we were able to, or that, that they have the girls in, and we were able to go and tour some of these homes. And when we got there, there was, you know, we, we were all sitting there, the whole team is kind of sitting there, and these girls are all sitting on the floor, and, and they're going around, and they're saying their names and their ages, and, and, and you know, then we go through, we say our names and where we're from, and, you know, and it, it, it's kind of awkward because they don't speak great English. It's, it's kind of limited the, at the school that they go to. They're, they're learning English, so it's broken. And, you know, so but it's just kind of this awkward interaction. And then one of the older girls said, well, would you guys like to see the house, tour us around the house? We said, absolutely. And so we all stand up and, and you know, some of the girls, you know, kind of started leading. And, and this one little girl, I'm going to call her Angel. She came up to me and she grabbed my hand and she started to, to, to tour, all, tour me with this big group just dragging me through, you know, room to room, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm a 48 year old white guy. What's your last experience with someone like me? And you're taking my hand and showing me around your house. My heart just started to break. 
And as we went room to room, we, we go into to the different bedrooms where all the girls are, you know, they have these, they have bunk beds and there's, you know, probably room, you know, seven or eight bunk beds, six or six or seven bunk beds. So, you know, 12, 14 girls in the room. And, and I asked her, I said, I said, so which is your bed? And she pointed at it and she was so excited. It was all made nice and there's a big stuffed animal, you know, it was all, I mean, look, parents, I wish my kids would make their beds as nice as they made them because they were tight. And so she was all excited. And so, you know, we went, and she, so, you know, we walk out of there and we go, you know, into, we're touring the rest of the house and she's just dragging me along, dragging me along. And we get up to the roof and she takes me over to, to the overlook and we're overlooking the garden. And she's telling me about all these things that she has, all the things that they've planted. And then, you know, they, they have clotheslines out there. And so, you know, her and some of the other girls start running around through the different clothes and, you know, and just laughing and giggling like they, like they do. And, and it was, it was a really touching moment for me. So we wrapped up that, that tour and, and went on about our way. And the next day we went to the school and we were working at the school and she came through the gate and, you know, all the girls that we had met the day before kind of walked through and they're waving, you know, and they come over and they kind of give you a little side hug and, and she kind of waved and gave me a little side hug. And I was like, man, this girl, you know, she remembered that's, that's kind of cool. And so that was it. You know, I told her, I said, have a great day. And she went off and, and, uh, the next day we went up to the farm and we worked there for about a week. We got back from the farm and I had to go to the school because I was getting my, my school uniform. So I went a little bit early before the rest of the team. And I walked in and, and talked to the folks that I needed to talk to. And, and then I was just standing out there in the courtyard waiting for the rest of the team to show up. And the kids started arriving for school. And coming through the gate is this little girl that I had met a week before. And she had, her, she, she looked at me and she saw me and her eyes got about this big. And she had a grin from ear to ear. And she started running, running, arms open wide, wrapped her arms around me. I missed you so much. And my heart melted. I was done. I was undone. Undone. Because this little girl just showed me love. She was so excited to see me. And so I asked her, I said, I said, I said, can I take your picture? Can I take a picture with you? And, and she does her head like this, which means yes, which is, it's something to get used to because it's not yes, it's yes. And so, so she kind of rattles her head. And so I took this picture and, and I asked, I asked the leadership, I said, I would love to show this picture of, of, of this girl. And because I want to tell this story and, and, you know, they said, well, typically when it comes to the kids, we like to blur their faces just because, you know, they, I mean, some of them have, have things going on or, or, you know, things that, that we don't want to show them. It's, it's for protection, but let us see the picture because, you know, sometimes they'll allow you to do that. If you would, will you click that picture? This is her. Her smile lights up a room. Her smile lights up a room. But when I showed them the picture, when I showed them the picture, they said, oh, yeah, we know her. If you could blur her face, please, because if you knew her story, you'd want to protect her too. I don't know if she was trafficked. I don't know if she's a sibling of someone who was trafficked. I don't know if, what her story is, but in that moment, she represented all these girls. And I just thought to myself, Angel, what horrors have you seen? What ugly side of humanity have you seen? And can I be real honest with you? This may not sound normal coming from a pulpit, may not sound normal coming from a pastor, but I got in my flesh. And I said what I wouldn't do to spend five minutes in a room with one of those people that hurt you. It's real, y'all. I'm laying my soul out right now what I wouldn't do. And it was in that moment that God immediately spoke to me. He spoke to my spirit and he said this, aren't you supposed to forgive them as I forgave you? Aren't you supposed to love them as I've loved you? And at that moment, that's when I took on this, the weight of this cause, the burden of this issue. You see, so many of the people that, 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 that do, that abuse like that, were abused themselves. They're just perpetuating a cycle. But let me tell you, that doesn't justify their actions, but what it does is it demands empathy and it demands forgiveness. And if we as the Big C Church, if we as Christians, as Jesus-professing Christians, 
can see how Christ walked, isn't it our responsibility to walk in that same way? It's not easy. It's not, not easy. It's not just in Nepal. It's everywhere. Just because we close our eyes doesn't make the boogeyman go away. Just because the church doesn't see it, doesn't want to look at it because it's ugly, it's dirty, it's, it's gross, it's, it's something that you don't want to hear from a pulpit on a Sunday because you just want to feel good. Just because we don't address it doesn't make it go away. We can't turn a blind eye to the ugly side of humanity. We have to, we, Southview, all of us, we have to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. Psalm 82 says this. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. It's right there. We have to show love and forgiveness even to those that we don't want to. Just because you forgive doesn't mean you have to like. Just because you show love, the, 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 the love of Jesus doesn't mean that you have to say, hey man, it's okay. No, it's not okay. What you did is not okay. The things that you have done, the things that you have perpetrated, what you've done is not okay. There are results that come from your actions and you will live and have to deal with those results. But as a Christ follower, I can show you the love of Christ. I can share with you. We can walk this out. Jesus told us how to do that. Jesus said in John 13, these are Jesus' words, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, so you also are to love one another. It's our job to affect change. It's our job to start it. But how do we do that? There's just so many. There's just so many. There's just so many, and I'm only one person with limited resources. There's just so many. What do I do? One day after a storm, there was an old man, and he was walking along the beach. And as he was walking, he noticed all these starfish that were washed up on the beach. And he came across this little boy. This little boy was picking up a starfish, chucking him in the water. Pick up a starfish, chuck it in the water. And the old man walks up to him and he says, son, what are you doing? He says, I'm saving the starfish. The old man looked, at, looked and said, there are starfish everywhere. You can't save them all. Kid picked up a starfish and he chucked another one. And the old man says, it's not going to make a difference. Kid picked up a starfish and he chucked it in the water. And he looked at the old man and he said, made a difference to that one. Made a difference to that one. Tell you another story. There was once this, this, this being that was there from the beginning. And he made a creation that he loved dearly. And that creation fell away from him. And he set in, he set in, in place a rescue plan to come and save them. And even if it was for one, it had been worth it. we can make the life in the difference of just one, it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. How do we do that? We take action. There's two ways. One, we can go. We can go on the mission field. We can do things. I get the question all the time, isn't it dangerous? Eh, I mean, it depends on what you're doing. It depends on where you're going. It could be. Aren't you afraid of, of getting in trouble? happened before aren't you afraid of dying you got a wife and five kids aren't you afraid of that i've reconciled myself to that i trust god with my family more than i trust myself so why would i have to fear that i go one step further i'd say do i fear dying no and neither do you you fear the process you fear what comes after because you haven't set yourself up in a way to make sure to know that god is going to take care of everything If Paul can say, to live as Christ, to die as game, what do I have to fear? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Hey, fam. I uh, hope you enjoyed that message. Have a great week. We love you.